Welcome to Second Seg, the show that focuses on the issues behind the news. ESCOM CEO Andre Dereta has expressed support for a lifting of the licensing threshold on distributed generators from 1 megawatt to 50 megawatts. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss the significance of the statement. Hi Terence. Hi Sachin. So why is ESCOM supporting the call for raising the licensing cap? I think the, the first reason is that ESCOM is seeing that we are going to be power short for some time. We've been, it's been over a decade now we've been having load shedding and the analysis shows that as we decommission old coal-fired power stations, there's about 10,000 megawatts that's going to leave the network over, the, over this decade. Uh, the gap between supply and demand is going to persist and grow. And we know that there, are, there is an integrated resource plan and that's ministerial determinations out for about 13,000 uh, megawatts of that through utility-scale projects, various technologies, solar, wind being the, the main two, but also gas to power. And even there's even still some coal, which is contentious and may never happen because there's a lot of legal action around those coal plants and the developers are also withdrawing. So there's a remaining residual gap um, of about 3,000, 4,000 megawatts that will remain. And we know the Integrated Resource Plan also caters for uh, at least 500 megawatts a year of distributed energy. This would be energy uh, that comes from mines, farms, uh, big uh, industry that are energy intensive that build some sort of capacity as well as, as, well as households. But the really the big megawatts would come from uh, from those sort of bigger energy intensive users. And we know that there are a number of proposed projects out there. Uh, one of the more high profile being Goldfields is 40 megawatts um, uh, distributed generation project, which is before MRSA licensing. So there's a view that we need more energy uh, in the system um, and that there's not enough really that's going to come just from the utility, utility scale procurement. And there's a big opportunity uh, to to get some of this energy from from industry, as well as uh, I think um, this will be funded off th off the balance sheets of the IPPs that supply uh, these big industries, as well as if these companies take equity positions, it will really be for their account, not for government or the taxpayer um, uh, the, uh, account. So it's important, it's quick, and it's uh, able to finance it. And the second reason is that Eskim has been told that it needs to restructure. So this fits in perfectly with the unbundling proposal uh, from Eskim. So it's very clear that Eskim will not be the only generator in town as it was in the old days. It already isn't. We've already seen uh, RPPs entering. Um, so th as Eskim unbundles, uh, there will be a competition in the generation space. There will be probably a monopoly sustained in the grid uh, space, the transmission system operator space, and there will be multiple distributors, which they already are through municipalities and ESCOM, but probably new distribution service companies emerging uh, as we unbundle and change our system to make it fit for the future uh, uh, energy transition ready, which it currently isn't under the current uh, centralized approach. So one, it's, it's, uh, or two, the three reasons are, one, uh, there's a need for more uh, electricity in the system. Two, it's supported by policy because there's, a, there's an unbundling uh, that is proposed, or it's policy now that the ESCOM must be unbundled, so that's the future system. There will be multiple generators. These distributed generators will be among those new generators. And three, it's financeable. It's, these projects are bankable, they make sense. Uh, in many ways, they are more competitive with ESCOM. And, uh, and actually, there's a fourth reason. It will be cheaper for, for, for ESCOM. And what is industry saying about the proposal and will government support it? Well, naturally, industry has been calling for this for many years. I think the current cumbersome processes around licensing, at the moment you have to get a license for anything above one megawatt. One megawatt is not a very big facility, and yet you have to go through a licensing process that's really more tuned to a mega coal-fired power station. It's really not fit for purpose. It's very cumbersome. There are, it takes many, many years, as we've seen with gold fields, to get uh, your project over the line. And um, so having a, liberal, a more liberalized, a more accommodative uh, regulatory process would be very useful. But it's not the only uh, issue that needs to be cleared. I think industry wants to make it clear that they're going to need wheeling. They need to have access to the network, either whether it's an ESCOM 
a network or a municipal network, it needs access. It also wants to contract with an RPP. It doesn't want to build these and operate these plants itself. So th there's a lot of debate around what is own generation. Own generation uh, uh, term has to be broadened to accommodate one that you're buying it from a, uh, a, um, an independent power producer. You're not building and owning and operating this plant yourself. Uh, two, you need to be able to access the, the municipal or ESCOM network to get it not just for your site, immediate site where you're building it, but you may want to send it to other sites or you may want to sell it to third parties. So th that's, uh, those are very, uh, very important elements that need to be sorted out. And, and, and then thirdly would be this, this, this ridiculous cap of one megawatt needs to be lifted. Well, does that hurt ESCOM in the long run? Well, if you look at the old style world of ESCOM, which was a centralized, vertically integrated utility, this probably wouldn't make sense. Uh, you know, you, uh, you're undermining your future revenue streams. You would have been the only game in town. But that's not the policy of the government. The policy of the government has changed. Um, in fact, already from the white paper of 1998, we envisaged an unbundling of ESCOM. So really, it's an, a well-established policy. But it's been reinforced by the actions that the, uh, the roadmap for ESCOM that the Department of Public Enterprises published all the way back in 2019. So the policy of government is that we're going to have a competitive generation sector. Distributed generators will be part of that mix. And uh, actually what we're going to be evolving to is an ESCOM uh, more and more where the, the natural monopoly, I think, is going to be in the, the grid company. And we need to, that is going to be the linchpin around uh, unlocking the energy transition. It's the, the pivot for everything. Uh, it, it, it enables uh, the, the injection of new renewable cleaner technologies. It enables competition in the system. And it, it is the, the key uh, part of ESCOM that needs to be financially supported and sustainable. And by having cheaper uh, distributed electricity rather than uh, very expensive diesel as an immediate tick in the box for ESCOM. And uh, ESCOM is battling to get that diesel compensated by the, through the tariff because every time they, they try and approach NERSA to say we kept the lights on using diesel, they say, well, it's not a prudently incurred cost, so it's a huge risk. It would be much better for ESCOM to be able to procure cheaper electrons or allow cheaper electrons to come in rather than having to rely on these very dirty and expensive electrons coming from diesel, uh, the diesel plant, the open cycle gas generator. So it's an immediate uh, tick in that box. And then there's also a whole lot of coal units that are not competitive, that are very dirty, that are not in line, aligned to our environmental policy. To get them to a state where they would be is going to require huge capital that ESCOM simply as an entity that would not be a going concern without our current tax taxpayer support into ESCOM you know, would be, uh, um, you know, it would be uh, a delinquent entity. So really there's a number of boxes that this could tick for ESCOM in creating the, the financial sustainability. But the most important is that it is taking us to a, a future fit energy supply industry where there's going to be competition at the generation end, which ultimately should hopefully Im improve the competitiveness of the tariffs, ultimately. There'll be a monopoly provider in the middle, uh, which runs the grid, and that's going to really be the most important enabler of the energy transition. And we, I think there's a natural monopoly and where the state-owned entity makes 100% sense, but, we, but it's been neglected because all the money is going to the generator, to the Madupis, the Kusile, and there's been underinvestment in the grid. So we need to stop that, halt that, and this, is, this again would help that, that halt that process of a neglect for the, for the uh, transmission company. And then you'll have a number of distributors on the other end. And again, more competitive, more choice uh, consumers will be able to say whether they want renewable electrons or whether they're happy to continue with dirty electrons, etc. So it's part of what we've already agreed, probably policy-wise, back all the way back in 1998. But definitely that policy has been underlined through the, the roadmap for ESKIM's transformation. And we now need to start acting on it. Thanks for speaking with us, Charles. Pleasure. That's it for today. Join us again next week for more news analysis. And don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.